If you have the time and are so inclined, I invite you to engage in a brief, somewhat unusual action. Find the darkest place that you can go to in your house an interior room or a closet, any place that doesn't have windows and that only allows in a minimal amount of light or preferably no light at all so that you can experience perfect darkness even with your eyes open. I'm talking about darkness so deep that you can't see your hand when it's right in front of your face. And no, just closing your eyes or covering your eyes does not count. There is something unique about having your eyes wide open, except for when you're blinking, of course, but otherwise having your eyes open and still being unable to see anything because light cannot reach you. Now, this is an invitation. It's not a challenge. And even if it were, either way, you would be more than welcome to decline. That goes without saying. However, if you do accept, I suggest trying to spend at least a few minutes in that darkness. And if you can make it up to 15 minutes, you will have effectively replicated the experience from the Tunnel of Mystery from Isaac Asimov's story, Nightfall. In that famous story, which was expanded into a novel in 1990 with the help of Robert Silverberg, the word darkness is given the proper noun treatment. It is the name for the ultimate menace for a society that is completely unprepared to deal with the absence of light. Of course, we don't have to travel to a distant fictional planet that is surrounded by six suns in order to find a society that has an unwelcome view of darkness, maybe viewing it as a potential nuisance, oftentimes, or even as something that is outright hostile to our state of being. Creation stories across multiple religions and cultures associate darkness with a sort of state of pre-existence. In various stories from ancient Egypt, one thing that they all have in common is that the world does not begin until after the sun rises for the first time. No light, no life. A similar account of creation can be found in the Mayan texts, or at least what we believe are the Mayan texts, and of course in the Abrahamic religions. God has to say, let there be light, before he actually gets around to creating anything that is alive. And in the thousands of years since these stories were first documented, we've only gotten increasingly unfriendly with the concept of living in absolute darkness. Look around your bedroom, or I guess any room of your house really, but check and see how many sources of light you have there. Is there a light in the ceiling? How many lamps do you have? Don't forget to count your various screens, your phone screen, television screen, computer screen, tablet screen. We are very evidently not fond of the concept of living without multiple sources of light that we have control over. And that is a sensible and defensible sentiment. Once you plunge into the world of darkness where you either have difficulty seeing or absolutely cannot see, you are crossing over into a fear of the unknown. As I mentioned in episode 1, there is a lot of cross-pollination between different types of horror and fear. Fear of the dark and fear of the unknown are very closely related. Because, of course, if you can't see what's around you, then it's a lot harder for you to know what's there. If you accepted the invitation to go into that dark space in your house, I wonder if your imagination started to get a little bit away from you as you spent more time in that space. Surely you know what was there before you entered that room or that closet. Before you shut yourself away from all of the light, you could account for all the things present and you know what's generally inside your house and what isn't. And yet, I do wonder if maybe while you were there, spending a little time in that perfect darkness, you felt an urge to maybe reach out, feel around, touch something familiar and reassuring, just as a reminder that you're in a safe place and that nothing could possibly be in there trying to get you. Or maybe nothing like that happened at all and you were just bored in there or you found it nice and tranquil and peaceful and thought, man, this is a nice spot for me to meditate. I should do this more often. And if that's what happened for you, then that's excellent and I envy the way that your mind works because mine doesn't work that way. Maybe that's a product of my long-standing horror fandom, although my grandfather did used to love to tell the story about a time when I was about three years old, long before I would have read my first horror story. 
and I woke up the entire house shouting about how it was too dark inside and I needed some light. That said, fear of the dark is hardly unusual for children, but it's considered a lot less commonplace among adults, so if any of that is carried over into my adulthood, then it possibly is attributable to my affinity for certain types of books and movies. Fear of darkness has long been employed as a subject or tool or theme in horror fiction. Many scary stories take place in or are even told in dimly lit or unlit settings. There are famous monsters that only come out after the sun goes down, and there are even some threats that are essentially made of darkness. They are living, moving, murderous shadows. And then there's yet another subcategory in this area of darkness-inspired horror. It involves photophobic creatures or ghosts, threats, that you can escape as long as you have some kind of source of light. Sometimes as little as a flashlight is enough to keep you out of harm's way. Some examples of this would include the 2016 film Lights Out, the film The Vanishing on 7th Street, and the film Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, both of which had festival debuts in the fall or around the fall of 2010 before being released within a few weeks of each other the following year. You have the X-Files episode Darkness Falls. You also have the Knight's Bridge sequence in Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere. Now those are just a handful of examples, and I'd be here far too long if I were to try to track down and list every single example of this that ever existed. However, I am not done speaking about the photophobic monsters that you can ward off if maybe you have a lantern or a candle or, as I mentioned earlier, even just a flashlight maybe. Because that's the subject of this episode, and in particular, a stretch of time from 2000 to 2003, or I guess if you fudge it a little bit, 2004, where this type of horror showed up almost annually, and the one year that it skips, we still get a story where photophobia is central to the plot. So let's start in the year 2000, right on the heels of the Y2K mania, with a film that was inspired by Isaac Asimov's Nightfall, at least partially inspired. The movie Pitch Black. If you're too young to remember the year 1999, then first and foremost, good for you. And I mean that sincerely, cherish your youth. I, on the other hand, am old enough not just to remember 1999, but the years leading up to it. And the multiple references to the end of the world, or at least the end of civilization, that preceded the turn of the millennium. Why did all of these references exist? Why was so much of this associated with the year 1999 leading into the year 2000? I think it's just because we love our large round numbers. We like decennials, we like centennials, and we like millennial benchmarks. That said, 1999 did have one legitimate concern associated with it, or at least associated with the year that it was leading into. And that was the Y2K bug, or Y2K glitch, or just Y2K. It ended up being much ado about very little. Because many, if not most, computer programs presented the four-digit year with only its final two digits, in this case uh, double zeros, the year 2000 would be read as the year 1900, which apparently would cause all sorts of problems, People anticipated widespread shutdowns, malfunctions, errors, and of course, by that time, we basically thought that everything important in our lives was run through computers. And that was 21 years ago. Imagine how we feel about it now. The good news, of course, is that civilization did not, in fact, end, and we all knew well in advance that all of this was very, very much overblown. Still, if you were to Google Y2K lights out, you'd find a surprising number of results. People did not just associate the Y2K glitch with computers failing and networks failing, but power outages, loss of electricity, loss of the light. That's right. Y2K was going to shut off the sun. No, not really. But 
there was some worry that it would impact power grids, but that actually never came to pass either. So how does all of this relate to the movie Pitch Black? Well, I have no evidence at all that any of the lights out hysteria from the end of the millennium actually influenced the writing of the movie Pitch Black. None of the sources that I could find regarding the making of Pitch Black indicated that Y2K was on anyone's mind when they were making it. However, I do think that the Lights Out hysteria might have influenced how receptive audiences were to the premise of the film. One thing is for sure, Asimov's Nightfall definitely had an impact on the movie. In fact, the original script for the movie was also titled Nightfall, and the basic high-level premise of the film in terms of its setting has an obvious link to Nightfall. The movie takes place in a far-off world that is surrounded by multiple suns so that it only rarely experiences true nighttime. And when that nighttime does come, something disastrous happens. In this case, instead of setting off a worldwide panic that results in societal collapse overnight, it brings out legions and legions and legions of monsters. The creatures in Pitch Black are subterranean carnivores that apparently only get to come out to feed on that rare occasion when the planet's three suns aren't shining. They are fast, they are ferocious, they are not hunting so much as just swarming over anything that moves and that they can get to unless that thing that they would otherwise eat is holding some kind of source of light. They are photosensitive, photophobic, they fear the light, and that sets them apart from the cave dwellers in a movie like The Descent, which pretty much don't care that the ladies' helmet lights are on. They will still swarm all over them, hunt them, attack them, fight them, and feast on them, regardless of whether they're holding a torch, a flare, or again, the lamp on their hard hats is on. The creatures in Pitch Black will stay away from you if you are carrying a source of light, and that becomes pivotal to the plot. It is a very specific, unique characteristic for this kind of monster. If you were being chased by a vampire, you would know that traditionally, at least since the movie Nosferatu, sunlight would kill it. So if you could hold out until the sunrise, you might be safe. However, if you were to crack a glow stick and wave it at them, they would just maybe laugh at you and then tear your arm off before going for your neck. Having an artificial source of light is meaningless to a lot of creatures of the night. They may prefer to come out at night. They may be uh, damaged by sunlight, but not just any old regular source of light. It has to be specifically the sun. In Pitch Black and in the other movies that we're going to talk about in this episode, any source of light at all is usually enough to stave off an attack. Now, of course, conveniently, in a lot of these movies, those sources of light have limited battery power or have a difficult connection to maintain and sustain and there's not a torch or even a candle around when anybody needs one or nobody thinks to light a fire or the fire can't be maintained and so that source of light is not an option for them. And of course when I said convenient a moment ago I meant convenient for the plot not convenient for the characters of course and as I say that Pretty much 80 to 90% maybe of the choices a writer makes are convenient for the purpose of moving the plot forward. And if they did not make those choices, the plot wouldn't go anywhere. So anyway, moving along. Despite what I think is an interesting premise and a pretty good setup for mayhem and horror, especially for the time, Pitch Black did not do exceptionally well at the box office. It did well enough, obviously, to have spawned several sequels, but that was more to do with the breakout character Riddick, not anything to do with the actual original film itself, so to speak. It, it's not like we went back to that planet, revisited those monsters, had another story about uh, creatures coming out only in the dark and being afraid of the light. The futuristic films left all of that behind, but at least some people in the film world must have really taken notice and liked that general idea, the creatures that can come out in the dark and that are afraid of the light, because this basic premise gets retooled and revisited multiple times over the next few years as people are trying to adapt it into something that maybe will turn into an even more 
profitable movie as opposed to a more modest sleeper slash cult hit. And one way to make a movie more profitable, or an idea more profitable, is to trim the budget and bring things back down to earth, so to speak. And that's what we're going to see increasingly done as we move from the year 2000 to the year 2002 and 2003, as we get more of these types of movies or more movies that utilize this idea. But before we leave Pitch Black behind, I do want to say that of all the movies that we're going to discuss that use this precise premise, I do think that Pitch Black is the most entertaining and makes the best use of its darkness and shadows and things that you cannot see. The movies that we're going to talk about a little bit later, after we get past 2001, they uh, they kind of trip over themselves, I think. They have some different ambitions. Some of them worthy the ambitions. Some of them maybe a little bit lower. But I don't think any of them quite hit the mark. And I think that if anything, Pitch Black has aged pretty well, special effects notwithstanding. You, you know, always are going to have to deal with that as time marches on. But I think just in terms of the general idea, the entertainment value, and the way it utilizes its idea, I think Pitch Black actually does very well. Another movie that I think does very well with its use of darkness and characters being afraid of the light comes in the year 2001, but it flips the idea kind of inside out. The Others is probably more well known for its ending, which reintroduces a tried and true type of twist that has been utilized in horror very often and had just been used a few years prior to that. But it also had the novel idea of having its central characters be afraid of light instead of the monsters being afraid of light. The lead character, played by Nicole Kidman, is stuck in a remote home, a very haunted-looking large house, stuck there with her two children who are both fatally photosensitive, so she always has to keep the light from coming inside and has to dwell within this darkness while she's waiting for her husband to come home from World War II. And of course, being a horror movie, very strange things start happening in the house that threaten the lives of the children. It is a very effective chiller. It doesn't really connect the string of movies here that I'm discussing in terms of movies that are about the evils that lurk in the darkness and can only get to you if you are away from the light, but it is a cousin to those types of films, that sub-sub-sub-genre of horror, and I felt like it was worth a mention given that it comes in the midst of that string of films. The Others, with its chiaroscuro visuals, was directed by Spanish director Alejandro Amenabar, and another Spanish director, this one with a Catalan name, directed the next film, Jaume Balaguero is the director of Wreck, one of the best found footage horror movies and one of the better zombie and just horror movies overall that I've ever seen, and also the director of Sleep Tight, a very unsettling thriller. This is a man who knows the genre and can handle it very, very well. And incidentally, if I did not pronounce his name correctly, then I'll actually be pretty disappointed in myself because I tried really hard. I even looked up several YouTube videos and a pronunciation dictionary before I gave it a shot. Anyway, as I said, this is a guy who is more than capable of making a very good to great horror film. Unfortunately, the movie he made in 2002 is Darkness, and it is not his best effort. It's not an unsalvageable idea for a horror film, but by 2002, it was a latecomer already to a different subgenre of horror that was popular around the turn of the millennium, that being the satanically inspired apocalypse horror film. Films like Lost Souls, Bless the Child, Schwarzenegger's End of Days, those kind of movies all came out between 1999 and the year 2000. So a couple of years later, Here Comes Darkness, which features a lot of the same thing, but also throws in an eclipse that is going to obviously give it a loose tie to the earlier subjects of this episode, that being Nightfall and Pitch Black. Of course, both of those feature eclipses, blotting out the sun. And then later in Darkness, toward the end of the film, we actually get the introduction of creatures that can't attack someone as long as they are protected by any kind of source of light and who have to try to talk that person or trick that person into snuffing that safety, that source of light, so that they can then be attacked and killed. 
Darkness has some different ambitions in terms of what it's going for as compared to Pitch Black. It's got a lot more in common with the others in terms of incorporating family drama dynamics, the fear of hurting the ones you love, not being able to protect the ones you love. But again, the movie does end with multiple instances of evil creatures, demonic imposters in this case, being unable to attack anyone, being powerless to kill anyone. As long as that person is holding or is even just near a source of light, even if it's something as small as a uh, flame from a gas stove or a flashlight. And I think that these scenes are the most effective and frightening moments in the film. I wouldn't completely write off Darkness, and it did actually do pretty well at the American box office when it was finally imported overseas now. That was two years later, which made it seem like even more of a latecomer to the apocalypse subgenre. And also, it had been trimmed to uh, 14 minutes less than its original runtime. Obviously, you're missing some pretty vital things there, so the American version is noticeably inferior to its original version. That said, even with that in mind, the original, I think, still is a lesser effort from Zhao Mai as compared to some of his best work. It's a noticeable step down. Still, again, I wouldn't completely write it off. And if you're curious about it, it's, it might be worth a watch. You might have a different opinion of it than I do. A movie that might be an even bigger missed opportunity when you look back at its origins was also released in 2002. That movie is They, or Wes Craven presents They, as it was known when it was originally released in theaters. While that title might fool some people into thinking that this was directed by Wes Craven, this was actually just executive produced by Craven. Generally speaking, anytime some big name is listed in a title or in on the uh, marketing or poster for a movie, but it's just uh, saying that they present the movie or it's brought to you by so-and-so, that means that they, they, they didn't direct it. They're just more behind the scenes, possibly having a very hands-off approach regarding the actual production and just lending their name primarily for promotional purposes. They was directed by Robert Harmon, who is something of a one-hit wonder in the world of horror. He directed The Hitcher in 1986, his feature film debut. Now that is one hell of a film to have as your big screen breakthrough when you're just 33 years old, and you'd like to think that that's a sign of some incredible things to come, but unfortunately he would never reach those heights again and not really ever come close. Nonetheless, he was tabbed to direct They in 2002, and his competence as a filmmaker does salvage some of the movie and does make part of it watchable and even certain scenes a little bit memorable. However, at the time, it was potentially overshadowed, at least among horror fans like myself who spent a lot of time on the internet, it was overshadowed by the controversy surrounding its script and in particular how far apart the finished product is from the original script written by Brendan Hood. If you were to make a film out of that script, it would have almost nothing in common with Robert Harmon's film. I remember reading that script years and years ago when the movie came out and thinking it was really, really good. And also having that be a seminal moment for me as an aspiring writer because I wanted to be a screenwriter. And realizing then that even if I were to pack up and move to Hollywood and try to pitch my screenplays, and even if I was lucky enough for somebody to buy my writing, buy my screenplay, the end product actually could look entirely, entirely different from what I had actually put on the page. So that steered me toward instead trying my hand at short stories and working on a novel. And as of now, I've had far more success with the former than the latter, but I'm still working. Interestingly, a similar experience also influenced former screenwriter David Toohey to want to move into the world of directing films because he realized that being a screenwriter left you powerless and being a director meant you actually got to put your vision onto the screen and of course David Toohey went on to direct Pitch Black. And while Pitch Black inspired by Nightfall, took this type of story about monsters that can only attack you when you're away from the light into outer space. And then Darkness brought it down to Earth, but still featured a celestial component regarding the eclipse and also had apocalyptic aspirations. They is a lot more grounded than either of those two earlier entries that we focused on. It does have some potentially interesting ideas along its perimeter, but those mostly go unexplored. Ultimately, it is just a movie about people who are being hunted by creatures that can only kill them if they are found in the dark. It introduces the subject of night terrors, but that's barely even a plot device. It's really not all that important. 
Ultimately, likewise, the creatures are discovered to be extra-dimensional, but that's not really all that important to the story either. And while with a movie like The Hitcher, it feels like the decision to leave certain questions unanswered was made specifically to enhance the movie's capacity to haunt us and stay with us and terrify us. With They, it feels like that decision was made because, eh, who cares? Still, as I said earlier, the movie does have its salvageable moments largely surrounding the idea of what it would take in order for you to stay out of the dark for the rest of your life. It's one of those things that you might leave the theater laughing about. Or you might watch it from the comfort of your couch, turn to the person you just saw it with and say, you know what I would do if I was in that situation? You know how I would survive this? And then say something that makes it sound remarkably easy. But thinking about it a little bit more from a practical standpoint, trying to stay out of the dark for the rest of your life would at minimum be really exhausting and at maximum potentially Borderline impossible, particularly when the creatures can cheat and sabotage electrical lighting. And to they's credit, it does end on a thematically fitting dark note. The same cannot be said for the last movie we'll discuss in this string of similar movies from 2000 to 2003. Darkness Falls. We are no longer in a distant galaxy, we are no longer facing down Armageddon, and we are no longer dealing with creatures from another dimension. We are in a small town, a small coastal town called Darkness Falls, and we're dealing with an old-fashioned vengeful ghost. Now, I love an old-fashioned ghost story. I love an angry specter coming back to kill people in a justified or vain attempt to right the wrongs done to it when it was alive. In fact, such an old-school ghost story might be one of my favorite things when it's done right. It takes me back to when I was young and first fell in love with the horror genre. That said, I'm not a fan of Darkness Falls, and this movie does appear to have some fans, although from what I could see, a lot of those fans are people who saw the movie when they were very young and have never been inclined to reassess it, and if you don't want to reassess it, then... Obviously, just enjoy what you enjoy and love those memories. Hold on to them. For me, this is the least interesting of all the films that we focused on in this episode, possibly because by the time I actually got around to seeing it, I had already seen, and relatively recently at the time, Pitch Black, Darkness, and They. So for me, Darkness Falls felt like more and simultaneously less of the same. Pitch Black, again, was a sleeper hit. It did a little bit better than double its budget during its original theatrical run. They actually finished its theatrical run in the red, while Darkness managed to make a little bit more than three times its budget in theaters worldwide. Darkness Falls, however, made more than four times what it cost to produce. Now, of course, if I were to introduce the others into this arrangement, then that one would blow all of the others out of the park. But that movie is at most a cousin to this specific subgenre and not an immediate family member. Back to Darkness Falls, it has a sort of folkloric quality to it that should appeal to me more than it does. It's a movie about an old woman, disfigured, who essentially is a small-town tooth fairy, but one day she gets accused of witchcraft and child murder and gets lynched by some ignorant, angry yokels. Of course, the accusations against her turn out to be false, but she still manages to place a curse on the town. As part of that curse, she comes back to visit every child in town when they lose their last tooth, and it's at this point that this story element makes me think maybe the movie could have benefited more from being less straightforward and more dreamlike, really embracing the idea of a dark fairy tale. What we end up with instead is sort of an elongated episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark punched up with PG-13 level violence. Now, I'm not against Are You Afraid of the Dark, but there's a reason why its episodes were less than 30 minutes long in terms of actual content. I'm also not anti-PG-13 level violence. If you look at the original Halloween and base it solely on its bloodletting, it would be a PG-13 movie by today's standards, and by 70s standards, without the sex and nudity, it could have been a PG movie. I mean, compare it to Jaws, and Jaws is far more graphically violent, and it's a PG movie, so why not Halloween? So it's the sum of these parts and not the individual parts alone that make them detrimental to Darkness Falls. This is the only movie out of this string of films that doesn't have a single moment that strikes me as memorable. Even its post-credits opening, which seems to have made an impression on its supporters, comes off to me as derivative and inferior to a similar scene at the beginning of They. Darkness Falls might be the least interesting version of the photophobic monster stories covered in this episode. 
but it also might be the most accessible, which might account for why it was the most successful, at least initially. I do find it interesting that after four years and four movies featuring this very specific type of threat, and right after releasing the film that gave them their best return on investment, filmmakers and studios basically abandoned this idea for the rest of the decade. Given Hollywood's copycat nature regarding films that make good money, you would think that something like the Don't Be Afraid of the Dark remake or the film Lights Out would have come out in 2005 or 2006 instead of 2010 and 2016 respectively. Granted, Saw would shift the dynamic of what was the hottest item in horror when it was released in 2004, but it's not like they stopped making any other type of horror movie, including supernatural ones, while the torture flicks were in vogue. More of these movies could have been made and potentially have found a big audience, but for whatever reason, Darkness Falls is where this unusual train of horror movies featuring photophobic evils ends. Maybe we had gotten far enough away from the year 1999 and the Y2K bug, for the idea of all the lights going out on us to have lost its luster among creatives. Maybe nobody wanted to be the fifth person in line to take the baton. Maybe there was some other reason, but obviously the idea still holds some appeal, and probably always will. We still see movies like this, just never in a cluster like this. And maybe I'm off base in suggesting that Y2K was the inspiration for this, but if not that, then I wonder what it could have been. Maybe it was all just a coincidence, but I'm inclined to think that there had to be something that motivated people to try and try and try and try again to scare audiences with the idea of something that can only come after you when things go dark. Thank you for listening to episode two of the Healthy Fears podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, I encourage you to subscribe. And if you haven't already, listen to episode one. Then join us in two weeks for episode three, where I'm going to talk about one or two or maybe three scary little kids. If you would like to read some of my short stories, my full publication credits, as well as my thoughts on various things, but usually horror, can be found at johnnycompton.com. One way or another, until you hear from me again, maybe try to keep the lights on.